Okay, so today I'm going to be filming, uh, putting down some paint on on this uh, drawing I did recently. Um, so far I've taken, uh, I don't know if you can see that, I've taken a, a micron pen and just gone over my pencil lines and then erased my pencil lines. Um, and I used, this is my reference for drawing a coffee crisp. It's not perfect. There's a couple things that are going to bother me, but whatever. The, the idea gets across pretty well. I'm not sponsored by Coffee Crisp. I just uh, felt like drawing this ridiculous thing. Um, so first I'm going to start off with just picking out the areas that I want to um, keep dark as I go. So I'm using a neutral tint and then I have these two colors and they look very similar to me when they're in the uh, pans. They're both quinacridone. I believe this one is quinacridone violet. Um, and then this one is quinacridone magenta, possibly. I'm, I'm fairly sure that's what I've got going on there. So, because I can't tell them apart when, you know, when I reach for them, I, I get both of them out. Um, I'm just going to mix that with neutral tint. So I'm getting kind of a... My, my goal is a gray-purple. Where it's very much gray more than purple, but it has just a bit of a purple to it. <coughs> this part usually takes me a little bit of time because I, I pick a color and I make a swatch and I see if it's the color that I'm after. And in this case, no, I want just a little more, a little more color to it. And then I decide, well, that's too dark, so I'm going to add a little more water. And then it's going to be too light. <laughs> anyway. Actually, that's about where I want it. Perfect. Okay, so once I've got that all figured out, I look at my piece and I decide, okay, well, where is the light going to be and where is the dark going to be? So right away, there's a couple spots I know are going to be just as close to black as I'm going to make it. So I'm going to go ahead and start with that. This is a uh, hot press paper. And in my experience with hot press paper, it just dries a lot faster. So I've got to be really careful because if I stop and I leave like a bead on the paper, it's going to show when everything is dry. And I usually leave quite a lot of water on the paper as I go. Um, I'm sure that's a bad practice. It's better to not have too much water when you're painting with watercolor. And it's something I really struggled with is uh, like making sure there's a balance between water versus uh, paint, like pigment. Sometimes, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but sometimes my brush decides to lose like a single bristle and then that little bristle, uh, it's almost like it creates an extra uh, bead of water at the end of my paintbrush and I try really hard not to uh, let that mess up my painting too much, but sometimes, well anyway. using a lot of water. I've been known to do that. Or I use too much water, like I was saying. But I'm using water um, 
from my dirty water uh, cup. So I have two cups, a dirty water cup and a clean water cup. I'm using some dirty water to lighten up this last little bit of um, purple. I'm actually just using the purple as a shading, it's like an underpainting. You don't always need to do an underpainting with uh, watercolor. In fact, most of the time you really don't, but that's okay. Now I'm using a reasonably dry brush to help uh, blend that out. I don't quite want the very ends, the edges, to be uh, painted because I like uh, I like to use the paper as a natural uh, white that you know, translate into the piece. And I'm just kind of tickling this up, I guess you could say, uh, so that the the harsh line I've developed here is less harsh. Kind of play with it with uh, what do I have on my brush right now? Nothing. Just <laughs> basically the water that I picked up. Um, I like to make a few little shapes with the water as I go because as it dries um, that makes a difference in the textures that are left once it's once it's dry. So see I've got like that going on. So I'm gonna go up here. I'm just gonna trace some of my the cracks I've drawn into the rock here. There's no right or wrong way to really do this. It's just whatever you feel. So the gray I'm using is neutral tint. I really like neutral tint because you can change its color uh, pretty easily. For example, I could add yellow or I could add blue. But the difference between neutral tint and um, Payne's gray, which is what I originally started out with back when I first started painting. Uh, Payne's gray is really wonderful don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's not. Um, but the problem is that it's, for me anyway, it's not really a problem, it's just a preference thing. Uh, it's got a bit more of a blue tint to it. And for what I'm doing, I don't necessarily want a blue tint. So if I were to add a yellow to Payne's Gray, it would end up just giving me like a green thing. That's not necessarily uh, what I would be trying for. So that's why I switched to neutral tint and um, if I want Payne's Gray I just add a little bit of blue to my neutral tint and it's pretty much the same thing. 
pretty much. I mean, it's not exactly if uh, if pain scary is your thing. Ain't no shame. You know? <laughs> not saying one is better than the other. It's just that I, for the way I use my uh, my gray, I prefer I prefer a neutral tint. Now, for this part, part of why I added more gray, I'm gonna do it again. Actually, just a little more gray. Part of why I added more gray is because. The coffee crisp is going to be very much um, like yellows, and I don't want too much, uh, too much purple in there. It's gonna kind of, it's not gonna look as good. I'm gonna just go over this real careful. I shouldn't say careful. Quickly, I'm trying to leave kind of an edge where. The light is going to be more of an issue, like it'll be hitting the edges of the bar, but the front of the bar is kind of facing away from the light, so... Oh man, I don't know if anything I just said made any sense. <laughs> the way I... what I'm thinking about here is the way the light is going to be filtering into this cave that I've drawn is... Uh, it's going to be hitting the back of this chocolate bar more than it'll be hitting, you know, the front. So the front isn't going to be very well lit. That's why I've decided to go with, um, so much of it is going to be, like in the front here, is going to be in shadow. If that made sense. I'm also trying to vary up my shadows so there's some streaks and such because the a coffee crisp bar has a lot of wrinkles and, and shadows in it. So for example here, there's a lot of uh, shading and texture that's going on in like the wrinkles of the thing. So I try to kind of give a, a general sense of what that's like from you know, as I'm uh, painting it. Okay, sorry for the jarring change all of a sudden, but my camera died, so this is a completely different day. <laughs> so I've laid down the, the shading, the underpainting that I wanted to get down, and now I'm going to work on, I think I'm going to do the sky first. So for that I have two colors, I've got like a, this kind of blue, which I've refilled myself so I don't remember the name of the blue, and this is, again, this is a handmade dish that I made. Um, this one, though, is a turquoise color. So I've got just a scrap paper. I usually paint all over it over time, but to make my swatches. So I'm going to make, I would like a turquoise sky, but it would like I'd like it to be a little more blue than green. Turquoise is kind of a an in-between color. So like here's here's turquoise. I'm mean, gonna even just it's fully dry so I can rest it on there. And I'm gonna add some blue. So I take paint and just kind of add a little bit of a blue. 
um, how blue or turquoise this guy ends up is, like all things in art, very subjective. It depends on what you, what your goals are as a as an artist, and and what your goals are for the piece. So I'm pretty happy with that as a sky color. I'm going to pull up my chair, sorry for the loud noises, <laughs> and just begin painting the sky. I like to gradiate my sky color, but because this is a hot press paper, I'm not sure that I'll really be able to do a good job of that this time, because I'm used to working with uh, like cold press paper which allows me to put on some paint and take my time, but hot press, you have to work a little faster. One of the things I can do to improve this situation is lift up the top of my page to let gravity do a bunch of the work. It's not a perfect situation. If I had like a, um, some kind of easel, that I was working with, then this would be a different situation because I wouldn't be physically holding up the paper, but whatever, I don't mind. Okay, so I'm about, I don't know, about a third of the way down. I'm going to start adding a little more water to help bring that down into more of a gradient. Like I said, it's not super easy with this type of paper, but I'm willing to try. We're going to try doesn't always work out, and that's okay. Watercolor has its own uh, priorities that it just decides. So I'm okay with that. I trust the process. Trust the watercolor to make some interesting uh, textures and such in the sky. Uh, got um, hair on my brush. Like my brush is uh, shedding a little bit, so that's frustrating. So at this point, I have a water line on this side and this side, and I'm kind of going back and forth. And I'm just using just water to um, This is called the bead. You want your bead of water to move consistently, but when you've got two sides of a piece like this, and I'm kind of working on both sides at once, um, you've got two beads. The bead of water, uh, I find with hot press paper, you almost need more of a line than a bead. That's why I have a line of water instead of just a bead, because I find that the, uh, the paper itself dries too quickly for just a bead of water when you've got this much to cover. I should really switch sides now, but I'm almost on this side, so we'll just try and pop that out quick. This is almost exclusively just dirty water at this point. I'm going to leave a little bit of a puddle, but that's okay because I need to come back to it anyway. The puddle is temporary. So I painted this one, this section, pretty quickly because I knew that I had to. But when you're doing a gradient, sometimes it's nicer if you take your time. I also forgot to get out a uh, scrap of paper towel. So you just touch the area that's got a bead of water that you like to pick up with a dry brush and it'll just eliminate that problem for you. So I have some texturing in here in this area. There's a, a dark streak and like a little bloom here, but I actually wanted something like that to happen because it's part of the personality of watercolor. However, if you are uh, not as flexible as me, 
or that sort of thing. That's valid. You know, you can you can do like a more careful job if you want. I'm gonna actually make just a little more blue up top. I'm gonna do a line of blue, and I'm gonna take a dryish brush, a dryish clean brush, and just gradiate that out. This is also a good way to make clouds because the water on my brush creates a whole new set of textures. It blooms and it picks up the watercolor underneath a little bit. There we go. Yeah, I like how that turned out. Okay, so that's the sky portion. I have yet to go over any of the other uh, sections, so let's talk about that a little bit. What my plans are and we'll see how they actually turn out because I I'm, I adapt as I go. The, the idea that I have in my head when I first start is sometimes a lot different than the idea or the, the result of what I end up with. So for this I'm taking my dry paper towel. I'm just gonna scrape that off so that I don't mix my blue and my next colors. So let's talk about the colors I have. This one is a sepia tone color. It's just sepia tone. Um, this is actually a yellow. Oh, I can't remember the name again. I'm sorry. And it's kind of a deep yellow followed by a medium yellow. And this is actually going to be a light yellow. Like they all sort of look the same. Or sorry, this is the medium yellow. Here's the light yellow. <laughs> they all kind of look the same as far as like it's yellow. But uh, let me show you the differences between the three. I'm going to use a mixture of all three um, over the course of the entire painting because the chalka bar has. Uh, a variety of depths to it, so I can't put that down. So what I'm going to do so the lightest yellow looks like this. Actually, if I try to take away some of that, it's it's actually quite light when it dries. And the medium yellow it's a lot more. Uh, it's almost more orange, I guess you could say. And then this mysterious dark yellow. It's actually, I forget the name of it, something like gold, but it's not a gold. I don't know. Depending on the concentration you put on. It might be gamboise or something like that. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. That's okay. <laughs> it's just words we use to describe a color that we all can see. So. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cheat a little bit by blow drying this to dry it up really fast for the sake of the video. And then I'm going to come in and start uh, painting the chocolate bar. Okay, hold on. Okay, so now it should be just about fully dry. Um, I had to take a moment to also charge my camera because apparently it's just too old for this stuff these days. So I'm going to start out with my lightest yellow. I'm not sure how much yellow I'm actually going to need, like if I'm going to use all three or not. Um, but I am going to start with just my lightest yellow and I'm going to go over this chocolate bar. So as I'm painting, it's important that I'm mindful of what the actual chocolate bar looks like because I have a lot of white that I'm, I've already over, I've already painted over some of it and I don't want to do that for the whole thing. Up here, this little bit of detailing, that's not really important to me, but the label to get the message across that it's the correct chocolate bar kind of needs to be distinct. So I've got to be careful not to color things that aren't meant to be colored. Sometimes I get so caught up in like the technical aspects of the painting, you know, how wet is my paint and where's, you know, what's dried versus what hasn't yet, and all that stuff that I end up uh, 
kind of neglecting certain aspects of the details, like I forget, uh, for example, that I meant to avoid certain areas because they're white, they're not supposed to be colored in. Uh, so that's just... Mm. It's about mindfulness, but it's also about uh, attention to detail, I suppose. It's easy to get too excited. <laughs> For me, anyway. So there's a few spots that I definitely missed when drawing out this chocolate bar that I'm going to address in kind of a subtle way. So instead of these little chocolatey bits here, instead of drawing them out and leaving them, you know, I'm I'm just gonna paint them in separately, at least that's my current intention, is to separately paint them in afterwards. Um, they're not going to necessarily be, it's because they're not much of a focus of the bar itself and a lot of it is covered up by this chimp. So whatever. I'm also taking some artistic liberties with this coloring here. For example, this little circle right here was meant to be done in red, but I did it all in black ink, and that's okay. When something has no light at it, like for example, this is sort of inside the cave, right? So it's covered in shadow. Distinct color differences between black and red would be a little harder anyway to, you know, so I can kind of fudge it there. That's not a big deal. Now I could stop here and I could uh, take the time to dry this really thoroughly before I move into the next color, but this section is not touching this section, so I'm going to do this as well before I move on. I want to keep that yellow, all three of the yellows really, involved. So this is my sepia tone mixed with yellow. When I do uh, closer things, I'm probably going to deepen this color a little bit. Maybe I should deepen it now, actually. Okay, so first I should do a swatch. I try really hard to remember these swatches. It's not always easy. So this is sepia tone with a bit of yellow to it. Remember that because this is supposed to be kind of far away. I'm going to end up uh, not adding a lot of extra details to this section. I want this section to be not uniform because I've deliberately shaded it to be not uniform, but perhaps a little more uniform than some of this, the, the details that I'll be painting in in the objects that are closer. When something's far away, especially if it's not something you're really focused on, um, you sort of mm, filter out a lot of the details of whatever that is, and I was hoping to do that with this, where we just sort of filter it out. I'm using far too thick a paintbrush for this little fiddly bit here, but that's okay. Not uh, gonna be totally perfect. And there's my cat asking to come in, but I cannot stop painting in the middle of this, as it is wet. He's going to be very upset with me. My cat really likes to watch me paint. Perhaps when I take a break to blow dry this, um, I can let him in. Assuming he doesn't decide to just sit on my artwork, which he sometimes decides is the appropriate response. 
because he just wants to be involved. Okay, so as you can see, there's some bonding issues that I've had here. That's okay. Um, I don't want to add too many details, like I said, but I don't mind a little bit. A little bit of contrast between the areas. This is just a dry brush and I'm just going to come in and I like the idea of the rock having a little texture to it, even though it's far away. Or far-ish away, anyway. And the way I have separated the rock into sections so a lot easier to do that sort of thing without uh, taking away from the general um, effect that I had going on. Before I dry this, I can probably get away with doing a little more uh, of the sections of... I guess this is rock, isn't it? All of it's rock. Anyway, more sections I can paint before I blow dry it to kind of speed up the process a little bit. I want this color to be spread out throughout to really unify the piece a little so I'm going to use that same color, maybe a lighter color of this, so a little more water, but the same basic color for this section of rock. I'm not leaving any of it uncolored, but that's a personal preference thing. If you want, you could do something where you leave just like a very slight edge of it white, like I've done here in the shading, but because I did all the shading, I feel like it'll benefit from just a wash. No big deal. So with the top rock there, I tilted my page downward. And I started from the top and I worked my way down. In this section, I'm actually doing that kind of backwards. And that's okay. If I wanted to use the gravity, uh, well, gravity to move the paint around for me, kind of have it do a bunch of the work and I could have started at the top or I could have tilted my page that way but I felt like this was you, know, you might notice that some of the purple from the shading is kind of bleeding through a little bit and that was intentional I'm also going to just do a little bit of say this rock because the next little bit of rock, I'm going to end up changing my paint color slightly. And I like having a bunch of different concentrations of similar colors to like having the same general color theme throughout really brings the piece together like a rock it brings the room together. Okay. Cat's not even in here. I'm getting cat hair on everything. <laughs> All right, I'm going to blow dry this. And so with the magic of film, this should be pretty instant. And then, ta-da, it's dry. Okay, so something I'd like to point out about using a watercolor block of paper is that when you blow dry, sometimes that's enough to lift up a bunch of the glue that holds the page down. So. In this case, it's like this edge and half of the other, half of this edge is um, now lifted off of the, the glue binding the paper to the rest of the papers. Sometimes at this point, I just take the whole paper off and I tape it to whatever surface I'm using, like my desk or, or a board. I prefer using um, just an MDF, a piece of MDF to hold my paint down so I can carry it with me. But so neither here nor there. Um, 
this will still do just fine, but it's going to be a little warped for certain portions. I'm going to have to be mindful of that. That's all. So for this next part, I'm going to add quite a bit more uh, sepia tone. I don't want it to be darker than this, but I do want it to be darker than this. So I have to find a value that's between the two. So I, first I'm starting it with just... Now that's quite a lot. That's quite dark. So let me show you what that looks like. This is quite dark. I'm going to want it to be lighter than that. Oh, it's pretty much light as I want it, actually. So, whoops. I keep dropping little spots here, and that's okay. That part is usually covered by, um, not the frame. The thing that goes in between the frame and the painting. I'm having word problems now. We are experiencing some rain. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take some of this. I'm going to go in here and help. Remember, I said that this and this needs to be sort of similar so that there's unity. Well, I also want this to be unity like to have unity with this whole section. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go right over top of that and it'll just kind of marry in. This new section that I'm painting doesn't have as much yellow to it. So this rock part that I already painted, the yellow is going to bleed through a little and it will look slightly different, which was my goal. You don't want it to pop out too much. Well, in this case, this for this particular piece, I don't want it to pop out too much. I just wanted it to be subtly different. some shading. I'm going to just add a little more brown to this section right here because I want to delineate it a lot better from this section. I'm also going to do the same thing here. It's still a different enough brown because of the yellow and everything that this shouldn't mess it up too much. It's a really subtle thing, and I'm probably the only one who's going to really notice, but it matters to me. Because this is a closer rock, I wanted a little more uh, definition to it, a little more something. And I believe that just about did it. Okay, so now the areas that I need to work on. I'd like this to be about the same shade as that. I'd like this to be just a little darker. So this, this, the section of background here, here, and here, I'd like it to be a little darker, but I don't want it to be super dark because these guys are going to be pretty dark. This I can paint. So, on the chalk bar, this is hmm, kind of more of a red brown, but that's okay. I'm paying attention to uh, this part, we'll say, is about the same. Ooh, it's hard to do with this thick, thick brush. That's okay. I could have changed my brush. I still could, but I'm just really into this brush, so I'm just going to try and even though it's a little difficult, I'm going to do it anyway. There we go. This is currently my favorite brush. I just like it a lot. 
So even though it's not always appropriate for the job, I uh, usually just wing it and go with it anyway. Which is a little strange. It can it can result in some strange effects because I don't always get the level of tiny tiny detail that I'm trying for with it. Forces me to be more mindful, which is important because like I've been talking about pretty much the whole video is a lot of this is just mindfulness work. So I'm gonna just drop in some more paint here to make it uh, a little more saturated. Same color but the pigment will be a little deeper in those areas. As you can see it's kind of soaked in a little there and that's all right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wet and then dry my brush. I'm just going to come in and gently touch it. This area is going to need to be a different color, but that's okay. For uniform purposes, I'm going to do this side too. Maybe just a little on the edges. when your brush starts to fray out and you're like, man, I knew it was good, what happened? Just uh, massage it back into place. No big deal. When it's a little damp, it's easy to do. It's also important uh, for the longevity of your brushes that you um, mold it back into its proper shape before you discard it. Before, before it, um, before you put it away. Okay, so I could do the red. I think I will, but this time I will switch brushes because the tininess of those details is going to be a problem for me. And I don't actually have a red. This is going to sound absolutely crazy because it kind of is, but I don't, I just don't like red. I don't like working with red, so I don't buy red usually. I have a variety of pinks, and I have this lovely mixture of brown I haven't gotten rid of yet. So what I'm going to do, I'll use a bigger brush for this. I'm going to look at my reds here, or reddish colors. I believe this one is the closest I have to a red. It's very much a, a pink, but that's okay. And then I'm just going to mix it in with my brown until I have enough uh, to be considered kind of close to the color I'm after. The brown helps dull the pink into more of I don't know. I'm happy with that. Let's do a color test though. I'm going to use my smaller brush. Saturate it well. And then I'm going to use my color swatch to figure out if I like that color or not. Mm. It's okay, but I think a little more something. I'm gonna go with a different color. This one is something like permanent rose, possibly quinacridone. I like using quinacridone colors, so pretty much all of my colors might be quinacridone. Sorry that I don't have exact. That's much better. Okay, so let's check that one. There we go. I'm happy with that. So even though I don't have a red, it's red enough. So this is very tricky work because uh, there's a lot of white involved on the wrapper and we don't want to screw that up. But it's very tiny, tiny details here. This brush is a size one round don't think it's a liner. It might be a liner, but I don't think it's a liner. Liners are usually much longer, but it's a tiny red, uh, tiny detail brush. It's a Curry's brand, just like my favorite brush. I'm actually really impressed with Curry's 
uh, store brand brushes. I'm surprised. I expected them to kind of suck because um, usually in other stores when I've tried store brand things, uh, it's almost just a money grab. They're, they're not really putting out a quality product. It's a brand product. But Curry's is doing an actually fabulous job. So, good on Curry's. I am not being paid to endorse them. Oh my goodness, if they decided to pay me, I would be delighted. <laughs> uh, I can't paint and giggle at the same time. Doesn't stop me from trying. I'm not sure why I start to whisper when I'm doing such tiny work, but it is what it is. Okay, so now here's slightly easier work is the lettering here. I'm probably going to speed this part up. Alright, so I left the O to last because it's colored in a little strange of a way on the packaging and I don't want to screw that up by not being mindful. So you see there was like a white space left on the outside of these curly Q thingies. So, doing my best to mm, do a decent job of that. Alright, I believe we are ready to blow dry it again. Alright, movie magic time. Alright, so my camera cut out and I'm not sure when exactly or what all was missed. So I'm just going to go ahead and recap. This section here I did uh, before I could do my orange highlights because the orange highlights on the bar, these little well, darker yellow highlights everywhere all over the bar, um, some of them will be touching this area and I thought well I'll just get this part done because because. <laughs> so I didn't want to get rid of all of the paint that was on my tray before I was ready to do that because I knew that I would need to add more brown to finish the background before I went ahead with the yellow. Or sorry, whatever. The point is that I didn't want to waste paint so I, I went with what seemed like the right choice. Now I'm going to go with this gambage or whatever Again, I, I'm not even sure what color this is. We're just going to right wing it. This weird yellow. This is nice and dry now, so I'm going to put this down to show you. This weird yellow color looks kind of brown, but then when you put it on the page, see it, it has a beautiful gradient naturally in it from like a deep reddish orange almost to a vibrant yellow. And it's also a darker yellow than what we got going on here. So I'm going to use a smaller brush for this because it's a lot of little fiddly details. And I don't want to mess that up. So I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to do my best to sort of follow along with the bar. So 
Let's start here. There's a line about here. And then there's one that kind of swoops down this way. How hard I press on my brush determines the intensity of thinness or thickness of my thing here. Line. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm just not communicating effectively. Sorry. Anyway. too much because the perspective like you can't see all of the details from every angle even what you are seeing on film is different from what I'm paying attention to from my angle right now so I'm trying to I don't know find balance there I remember what I said about the brown areas here little chocolatey bits. I was going to just paint them in afterwards. I haven't done that yet, but I probably should have. I probably should have done that before I got rid of the brown on my palette, but that's okay. Okay, so now we're going to go in and just do some really subtle work here. I feel like these lines I should have done, these little coffee lines, I shouldn't, I should not have done them in uh, black, but that's okay. strange that the person who designed the label here didn't um, didn't put anything inside the O or the R sorry the R or the P here the little there's no highlights in there it's kind of strange I wonder if that was intentional and what the thought was behind it So this little section here, I don't want to leave it totally white like that, so I'm going to go ahead and add just the smallest amount of, I have that way too much, just the smallest amount here of sepia tone to the yellow I was just using to make it kind of a, a brown color. Probably too yellow still, but that's okay. There's a lot of water to this, so it's going to lighten up quite a lot as it dries as well. But again, I like having kind of the same color repeated again and again in a piece like this to help bring it all together. I'm going with sepia tone in the yellow. And I'm going to do my best to just, so one or two of them, are, they're kind of touching the orange 
bits anyway. So we're going to do maybe a piece here and a piece here. It's going to be kind of a subtle thing and that's okay. I'm going to come back in, I think, even though I, I didn't really want to, but I think I'm going to come back in with uh, um, my pen. Micron. Micron pen. My brain only has so much function to it, and you know, I can't both talk and do this at the same time, apparently. <laughs> anyway, there, yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so the monkeys, sorry about the noise, the monkeys are, I'd like them to be a dark color. I'd like them to have a little bit of the red to them that the, uh, the Coffee Crisp has. So I'm going to start with... I'm going to start with the sepia tone. Like I said, I'm just going to touch that here. It's, it's very, very dark when I first put it on because it's just a dark color. And then we used these two reds. So I'm going to start with this one. I don't think I'm going to want more than that. I'm going to put this in. We don't want it to be... Uh, too red. Too red of a brown. So we're going to take a swatch. Mm, kind of red. I mean, well, it's obviously red, but I mean, it's a little too red for me. So there's two thoughts I have. One of them is I could add more sepia tone, but I think I'm going to add just a little bit of that uh, orange. Not orange, sorry. Dark yellow that we have going on. The one that we used for the uh, highlights on the bar. That's better. Okay, so. I'm not sure it's dark enough, but we can always go back in and darken it up again. dry. So I've got a um, an 8 micron, which is what I did all the line art in. I'm just going to, oh, where'd my chalk bar go? I'm just going to go in and just do like a basic uh, outline of these. I don't even want it to be a complete outline because I don't want to detract from the uh, details of the rest of the piece. So I'm not fully outlining them. You gotta find like a balance of subtlety, I guess. Okay, so like when we just glance at it, that doesn't look out of place, but it's also not... It's more of an implied detail than, than an actual detail, I guess. So the reason I want the monkeys to be darker is the, they're quite simply um, a focal point. And if they're a little darker than some other stuff, even though they're very closer, um, they'll pop out more. So I'm just adding some more sepia tone to the color we already had going on. So, I'm going to uh, remember that this guy has an ear that we don't want to cover with this color. I also wanted the brown of the monkeys to be different than the brown of the chocolate bar wrapper because I was worried that they would sort of mesh together weird. I feel like I've done a pretty decent job figuring that out.
I'm okay with some parts of the monkeys having a little more density to the pigment. Again, it's like the sky. I like there to be a little texture to it. And the watercolor, I trust it to just do that job. I don't need to think too hard about it because it's kind of an automatic thing with watercolor. If anything, it's something that's easy to need to fight. One of the best practices I've developed in doing a piece like this, where there's a lot of little details and a lot of things to think about, is um, before I give it to somebody, because this is a gift, but before I give it to somebody, I like to let it sit for a couple of hours or in a few days, come back to it and just look at it, really look at it for a little while, um, before I really am certain that it's done. Because, like with the the orange parts of the chocolate bar, or that little, this little fiddly bit here. Sometimes it's easy to overlook little tiny details like that, and then once you've given it to someone, it's too late. It's too late to fix them. So, yeah, sometimes I just hold on to it for a little longer, even though it's done, just to be totally sure that it really is done, and not just I thought it was done, but I was wrong. A couple of times I've given a painting to someone that I worked really hard on for many hours and I finally gave it to them and was so happy. And, and then I noticed that something was just terribly off about it and that I missed a big patch or something silly. And it's usually a really subtle thing too, for that matter, that uh, only I notice, but it'll bother me for the rest of my life. So. This is especially difficult if my client lives far, far away. So I take the time to just sit with it for a little bit before I give it away. Okay, I'm going to call that done. Like I said, I will sit with it, but otherwise I'm fairly sure that's complete. So we've got our silly chocolate bar situation going on here. And thank you for watching. Happy arting.